Well, hello, Matt. Thank you for having me on the show. Is it, is it, the, is it the Credo, the Credo Show podcast? Is that, is that yeah, what we're doing well, here? Usually it's, uh, it's not video. So uh, this is almost, you know, raw, right? This is oh wow, two guys on YouTube having a conversation about theology. <laughs> well, people have often said to me that they definitely would prefer to have me on video rather than on podcast, because apparently I do look like a cross between Conan O'Brien and New Jackman. Um, <laughs> Well, oh, I didn't want to say anything, but that, that's really the only reason I asked you. <laughs> yeah, actually, to be perfectly honest, it's more like a cross between Leon Morris and Austin Powers. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know that, that, that how, how you see yourself and others see you. Um, that said, since I was a small boy, my mother told me I had a face for radio. So uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know whether I should be doing any vodcasts, video uh -huh. or programmings like that. Uh, but it's good. I mean, it's good to, to talk to you, a, uh, a uh, well-known uh, uh, American Baptist theologian concerned with the doctrine of the Trinity and some of the weird things that have been happening with the Trinity. Now, I've got to bring up one weird thing, okay. not from the 21st century, not even from the 20th century, but from the 19th century. Okay. And this is going to be this is going to be one of those, you know, you know, you know those, those Morpheus memes like what if what if I told you? <laughs> That's going to be one of, one of those. What if I told you? What if I told you that 19th century English Baptists declared the Trinity a non-essential doctrine of the faith? Oh, you're really, boy, you're just like ripping open my flesh and finding the nerves, aren't you? Oh, yep, <laughs> yep. That's right. So it was a you know, 19th century Baptist declared the Trinity to be a non-essential. I mean, how do you get to that point? What, ha what happens when, you know, people saying, you know, I'm reading my King James Bible here and by golly, I cannot find any Trinity in there. Uh, is, is, this where, is, this, is, this, is this where all our problems start? You know, just people trying to read um, uh, the Bible in a particular way. Like in the case of the 19th century, I think there's a really weird coalition going on between some sort of um, very conservative, you know, Bible only people and suspicious of anything outside the Bible, whether that's, you know, the church fathers or the Pope or anyone, anything outside the Bible is suspicious. And then you've got this kind of like rationalistic, um, uh, more li modernist ways of reading the Bible that yeah. I think the Trinity was simply mm -hmm. a whole bunch of Greek philosophical nonsense. And, you know, we need to go back to that, to a, 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 a simple one true God and Jesus, his son or prophet, which leads mm -hmm. to a more Unitarian view of being bad so you've got that weird coalition of the yeah. kind of you know um fundamentalists i if it's not in the bible i don't believe it with yeah. a kind of union of of um english rationalism yeah. merging in the general baptists of uh the united kingdom i mean that, that's my understanding of how they ended up to that but what would you say if, if we put you in a time machine into a hot tub time machine yeah and you you're, you're to picking go on me too you're, you're gonna throw me in there because you know i'm the baptist <laughs> Yeah, well, you speak their language, you know their customs. What's going to happen yeah. when I get out of this this uh, DeLorean time machine? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so when you get out and you speak at the 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 Baptist General Conve Conve uh, Convention yeah. of Wiltshire or wherever they are, and this is where they're voting to decide that the Trinity is a non-essential doctrine of the faith. Yeah. You get up there, Matthew. What do you say to them? And can you try say it in an English accent <laughs> so they'll understand? <laughs> like well i think I, like uh, you're I, I say old boy that's rather poor form or something like that <laughs> do you do your best i don't know have you ever met carl truman do a carl truman accent uh i i think that if i did a carl truman accent right now um he would be uh so disappointed in me uh not for trying to imitate him but but for the accent itself uh i it, it would I don't think I can do it justice. Um, so, but I, I will say this. Yeah, when if, if you were to throw me in that time machine, which I would probably beg you, please, please don't put me in it. <laughs> but if you did, uh, I, I think that, you know, if they, they dragged me up there, uh, well, as soon as I opened my mouth, they would know I, I'm from another world. But uh, especially, you know, being a, a West Coaster from from the U.S. Uh, but besides that, uh, I think that 
they would probably uh, take me outside and stone me. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, naturally, the the first thing I would want to say to them would be, uh, first of all, what what Bible are you reading? <laughs> because uh, and how are you reading it? Right. Uh, I think you and I would probably agree that's that's the that's the more important question. Um, how are you reading this Bible uh, that you open it up and you get to the point where Orthodox Trinitarianism is nowhere in sight? Um, my, uh, my first piece of advice would be, where's the church? Uh, <laughs> are, are, is this it? <laughs> or have you taken a, a bit of a hint from reading the scriptures with the church if you if you have uh then we probably wouldn't be in this situation um of course it's not just past centuries right it's our own yep. it's our own century in which uh that type of mentality is alive and well and a type of uh very crude or narrow biblicism yep. uh in which uh we open the scriptures and if we don't uh, if we aren't convinced by a word study or a chapter and verse, um, then uh, the Trinity is, is just nowhere to be found, which, of course, yeah. is, is a bit ironic, isn't it? Because that's the same type of methodology uh, that we criticize when when we have uh, cults approach our door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, I think I think you touch on some good things, like you you say, well, like what Bible are you reading and how are you reading the Bible? And what I tell students is the Trinity is not a proof text; it's a hermeneutic. Okay, mm. it's what you need in order to make sense of Scripture. Now, it, it we both know it is true. You cannot find any single verse that says Christ is of the same substance with the Father. You right. know in in you know um uh, one god in three three persons you know one one eternity and unity you know that type of thing you cannot find any explicit verse but the trinity is what you need in order to make sense of what scripture does explicitly say so mm. it says that you know the father is god we learn the son is god we know the holy spirit is god we know that there is one god but there are three different persons because otherwise the baptism of, of Jesus becomes really weird where Jesus gets baptized. The father says, I'm pleased with my son. And then the spirit, I mean, if, that, if you do like that in a modalism way, it's just really weird. It's a, bit, right. a kind of funny act of divine ventriloquism or something <laughs> like that. So you, you can't, so, so, so if, if you take all these elements together, um, you know, there's one God, the three persons, um, the, the Trinity is what you need to make sense of what the Bible says. And that comes from how you're reading scripture itself yeah and 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 uh, let me just add to that uh and what the the church fathers when they came up with their their tradition tradition is just what the church learned from reading scripture right that's what it is and you know we, we live we live i don't know i don't know about america but we have we have a very sort of anti-tradition because we want everything new we want the latest iphone we want the latest shows on netflix we want the latest apps you know, and we don't, you know, we don't, we don't have any of that in America. That's just, you, you don't have, you don't have any of that. No. And it's the, so like when I've got my students in their like early twenties, so people who don't have no memory of the 20th century, I say, okay, this is what, this is what tradition is. Tradition is finding out which mushrooms are poisonous without having to learn the hard way. That's right. So, so when your Nana says, don't be eating that, you don't turn around to your nana and say, "Yeah, okay, boomer," and yeah. then munch on the mushrooms you found <laughs> in the forest. Because if you do that, nana's going to be driving you to the emergency room and the whole time saying, "I told you so, yeah. you silly millennial." What's going to happen? I, I think I'm going to have to steal that illustration uh, for my students as well. Uh, it it it's so fitting, isn't it? It's uh, it's like looking at the mushroom and saying, you know, what does anyone else know? Uh, um, I, I know, I know what a mushroom is, uh, so I'm going to eat it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. I saw something. I saw a video on YouTube. I know which mushrooms are fine and which ones yeah, aren't. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Because because that always ends well. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's. But I think people read that in in the same way. Uh, now, I, I also have to say, I think the Baptist tradition does have a proclivity this way. 
I don't mm. want to rag on you Baptists, okay. but you, you, you do, but, but which means I'm going to, um, but you do have a thing called the doctrine of soul confidence, where each soul is competent to interpret the Bible for itself. Now, here's the thing I've learned. I've, I've had many wonderful Baptist students over the years. And after marking their papers, I have to tell you, some souls are more competent than others <laughs> when it comes to interpreting the Bible. And the best way to determine whether your soul is competent or not yeah. is to compare it with the way other souls mm. are interpreting the Bible. Yeah. So I understand we want to interpret the Bible for ourselves, you know, for freedom of conscience and liberty. That is very good and very Baptist. And that's the good part of it. But it's kind of like I'm right. And everyone else who came before me was a moron. <laughs> that's that's when you got some serious problems and worries. Yes. And that's when you can end up being um, turning into a cult or, you know, um, or, or something like that. Yeah. Well, this is one of the reasons why. Um, and I, I can say there is some. Um, encouraging work afoot in, in Baptist life because, um, you know, I've had that same experience you've had uh, as, a, as a teacher. Don't eat the mushroom. Please don't eat the mushroom. And they're eating the mushrooms. Um, but at the same time, I've also been encouraged because uh, more and more recently, and, and a lot of this has to do with the Trinity. So um, mm -hmm. praise God for that. But more and more recently, I'm starting to notice uh, even Baptists are saying, hey, let's go back to our roots. Uh, yeah. Let's actually pick up the Bible and read it with those who came before us. And yeah. it's, it's uh, I love seeing the light bulb go on for them because uh, some of them are in biblical studies. Some of them are in history. Either way, they both start to recognize uh, I'm not the first one to pick up the scriptures and they start to uh, not just learn from, but depend upon um, some of those those first uh, first Baptist fathers and other other traditions as well. Um, yes. Which is it, it, at that point, um, there's a bit of a, a, a party going on in which uh, Baptists are sitting down at the table and having conversa conversations with with uh, all kinds of other traditions to try to uh, understand what scripture is saying. But I, going back to your point, I, I think you, you make a great point there about uh, what it means to read the scriptures in the first place. One of the ways I've put it to my students is, are you a Christian? Because if you're a Christian, then that means you read the Bible like a Christian. And that's, that sounds a bit, you know, stating the obvious, but uh, what I'm getting at is exactly what you said. Uh, when you open the scriptures, are you reading this as a revelation from God? And who is this God? Well, this is the Trinitarian God that we worship. Hmm. So <laughs> at that point, uh, we should expect then there to be some continuity with how he has revealed himself from Old Testament to New Testament. You know, like you were just mentioning, you mentioned Jesus's baptism. Um, I love to, to point students towards just the, the grand sweeping um, story of the scriptures as a whole to say, uh, look, at, look at how your redemption is accomplished. Uh, the father sending his son uh, to redeem you. Do you think that might uh, say something about who this son is from all eternity apart from you? Uh, John thinks so. John John tends to open his gospel that way, uh, and likewise with the Holy Spirit. So, I, I think when you uh, when you start to read the scriptures, not for like you said, you know, where is that that text that I can I, I, I can put in my you know my belt, but read the scriptures as a whole, you start to discover, oh, this is a Trinitarian revelation. And actually, it not, it not only tells us about what's happened in history, but it tells us something significant about who this God is from eternity. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll, let me throw this back at you for a minute, though, because I can't help but think of your, your, your uh, famous or infamous uh, Sausage Maker 3000. <laughs> uh, yes, th that is a, um, some people have a theological message, uh, method where you just basically get your Bible and um, 
uh, metaphorically you just you know stick into the sausage maker and grind it out yeah. and you know and out comes pristine christian doctrine which you can have with you know baptist bananas or with presbyterian peas um however you like it um but that's that that's not how you do theology it's it's not kind of a some sort of relationship between you and your your esv um the sort of mystical relationship uh, in order to study theology, I mean, the Bible is primary. I mean, the Bible is the the the, the highest authority, the the primary authority. Um, but it but it is it is an authority for which there are other uh, like derivative or secondary sources as well, and that includes things like you know like nature for one. You know, like if you're talking about you know what it means to be a human being, I mean the soul. Um, yeah, there are some things that you need to know about. You know, things like DNA or even elements of um, neurobiology. Uh, can help you on that. So you, you, you've got to look at that. Uh, you need to pay attention to tradition uh, because as I said, you know, a tr tradition is a tool for reading scripture. Tradition is what the church has learned from reading scripture. And you need to, to pay attention to that uh, as well. And then you've also got the element of things like experience and even to a degree culture. I wouldn't call culture a source of theology, but it is a certain context and you need to be conscious of how your own culture is influencing you, because um, that can happen very unconsciously. Yes. I mean, the very fact that you that you speak English, where you are located in the world, these are going to have unconscious influences on you. And by dialoguing with people from outside that context, both in history and in the global church, um, you know, we can point out things like, I like, you know, I'm not too sure that's actually a Christian thing to believe. I think you're only believing that because of your own context yeah. and this kind of this could dovetail into every discussion I've had with American Christians about the right to bear arms for militias. And uh, we could talk about universal health care, but I won't. <laughs> um, and all those, those other sort of things. Um, so that, so you, you, you can't just do um, theology is not something you do looking up words in a concordance, because that's going to lead to a very uh, you, you, a narrow myopic view. And yeah. you, you need a, a wide variety of tools or apps or supporting yeah. networks to come up with a more fulsome and wholesome theology. Again, with scripture as primary, yeah. but you know, it, it as I say, it takes a village to raise a theologian. Okay. You know, uh, on that note, uh, this uh, controversial uh, issue of how to read scripture um, has a lot to do with the doctrine of the Trinity. And um, if I remember right, you were uh, one of the, the early ones to kind of wave a flag saying, hold on, uh, there seems to be something wrong uh, with uh, the way that uh, some evangelicals were articulating the doctrine of the Trinity. And here, you know, there's all kinds of labels, uh, EFS, ERAS. Yep. Um, it, essentially, we're referring to, to those who teach uh, a, a functional subordination of the sun, but within the imminent life of God. Uh, so yeah. we're not just talking, these, these individuals are not just talking about um, the economy of salvation or the incarnation. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe you could, uh, could get us started to, to just, okay. what, what, uh, what initially alerted you? I mean, we've been talking about hermeneutics here. Was there yep. even like a hermeneutical, and you're looking at their hermeneutics, like you were just saying, you know, you don't just look up words in concordance and piece them together. Yeah. What sparked that for you? Well, there, there was a number of things going on. First of all, you had some scholars like uh, Wayne Grudem, uh, Bruce Ware and others arguing that Jesus and the Father, or Christ and the Father are equal in being, but they're subordinated in role. And it's the subordinated role that distinguishes them. Um, and they were saying how that maps onto parts of the New Testament, the Gospel of John and, uh, and Corinthians, and they were being accused of being airy and all that sort of thing. So my, my, my initial movement was a bit lukewarm because I pointed out, okay, look, these chaps are not Arian. They're not full Monty Arian. They're saying, not saying that Christ is a mere creature. And there is a kind of um, uh, a type of subordination which does reflect something of, you know, the, of, the, the, uh, of the relationships between father and son in, in, in a sense. Uh, but, but I've offered two very strong caveats. I said, um, first of all, 
um, you should not be using this language of subordination because that that's 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 because you're flirting with Aryan language, okay. Yeah. And uh, that's the, so I, I preferred Wolfhart's Pannenberg's um, the son's obedient self distinction from the father, but with obedience understood in the context of taxis order rather than RK authority. So uh -huh. you can talk about like a son's obedience that type of thing. But the other thing I said is, look, the, the main thing you're interested in is not the Trinity, but using the father-son relationship as an analogy for husband-wife relationships. Yeah. So, you know, as, you know, husband and wife are equal in being, but the wife submits to the husband and for his role and authority. And my, my response to that was, look, I think the analogy breaks down because unless you're married to two guys and a eunuch, I don't think this is really going to apply. Yeah. So, you know, maybe, you know, rural Massachusetts that could work out for you. Some of the crazy things they, you know, where the state's motto is, if you can carry it, you can marry it. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe, but, but generally this is not going to work for the rest of us. So I said, okay, look, they're not Aryan. Um, you've got Rana's rule that says, you know, the economic and the imminent do belong together, but subordination bad, the analogy with marriage even worse. Uh, but then um, some friends prompted me to read a little bit further. And I read a little bit more of Bruce Ware's work uh, where he does talk about the father having a greater glory, having more supremacy uh, within the Trinity. And then when I did a little bit more uh, just a reading of the fourth century Trinitarian debates, um, you learn uh, uh, about groups who are not just purely Aryan, but semi-Aryan. And you get the statements like written at the, what's called the blasphemy of Sirmium where they wrote something um, which talks about, you know, we should not use the language of the generation of the son because, you know, who knows the days of his generation from Isaiah, you know, we should just focus on the father's monarchy. Um, the son is just, you know, his agent. And, you know, if you read the blasphemy of sermon, I thought that summarized perfectly what people like Bruce Ware and Wayne Gruden were on about, which then made me think, okay, these chaps are definitely not Aryan, but they're very close to semi Aryans, okay, and that that's that's probably when I, I went from being sort of you know wary of like no, well sort of but maybe not to whoa this is this is definitely wrong in a serious way, and it was kind of so rereading Ware's language of of authority in the Trinity and then comparing them to some of the fourth century semi Aryans where that's that's when I I kind of moved here yeah, from being wary to this is warning, and then a few years ago the whole thing exploded uh, because there were, there were some people within the complementarian side who are kind of like, yeah, this is a little bit weird, but I'll just won't say anything for now. Just sit on the stage or on the podium next to Bruce and Wayne and smile politely when they're talking about the Trinity. But it all came to a head when um, a, a Presbyterian housewife called Amy Bird, was, who was part of the sort of complementarian movement, was kind of pressing back on this. And she was told by certain people to... Um, to be invited to still her tongue and speak not of things that don't concern herself, which then led her to unleash two British bulldogs in the form of Liam Golliger and Carl Truman, who released a whole hermeneutical kraken um, on this topic, saying this is not orthodox. It's got nothing to do with complementarian. So decide which day, which one of these you want to do. And the vast majority of people came out and said, well, actually, if we're all coming out of, out of the hermeneutical closet, um, I don't believe that. I don't believe in that EFS stuff, and and it led it led to a really uh, really big sort of um, then kind of a, a division within the complementarian camp uh, mm -hmm. between those who want a more orthodox view of the Trinity and those who wanted this shall we call it a more revised um, social Trinity in right. order to bolster their view of gender. I mean, is, is that your is that your understanding of of how the debate played out, Matt? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, I mean, you you put it there in a nutshell, but. Uh... Uh, when you, the way you just described it at the end there, I think you're onto something because uh, what was not being talked about, and, and still, you know, this is one of the points I try to make in Simply Trinity, uh, still to this day, there's been a lot of focus on a particular text or the son and whether he's subordinate, all those, those are important conversations, but the bigger picture was being lost. And you just put your finger on it, which is, hold on, uh, when EFS is describing the Trinity, um, it is, before it even talks about, you know, functional hierarchy and that sort of thing, it's using a certain vocabulary, a uh, certain language, certain, I call them rules of, of their game by which they play. 
And you mentioned some of these using uh, words and phrases like roles or relationships uh, or uh, uh, they would define the, the Trinity as a uh, community or society. And then from there, uh, like you mentioned from there, they then would uh, say, well, uh, you know, we, we understand others are wanting, you know, an egalitarian type of understanding. We want, uh, we want a, a authority and submission. We want a hierarchy. Well, that became, uh, as you mentioned, that then became very uh, convenient then to then draw the line to say, mm -hmm. oh, well, this is the pattern then for, for gender. Now you make an interesting yeah. point because um, you know you mentioned uh, you know someone like uh, Carl Truman or Liam Gallagher, and anyone who knows them will, will recognize oh these uh, these guys are you know card carrying complementarians uh, in the the Reformed Church, and yet they were uh, saying side by side with uh, you know egalitarians. Well, we may disagree on our understanding of, uh, you know, gender roles, that sort of thing. But we can agree that we shouldn't be using the Trinity this way. Um, yeah. And if we're going, going to redefine it as roles of, uh, you know, a type of society, well, um, that makes it all too easy then to, to kind of turn it like a wax nose to either side. So, yeah, did you want to add something? No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, what I tell people is sometimes the story is not about what you think it is. Like, you know, the Wizard of Oz? Yeah. The Wizard yeah. of Oz is not actually about a little girl in Kansas who gets <laughs> lost into another world. It's actually a, a parable about the American Great Depression. Okay. So in case that's what it's really right, about. That's how it starts, right? That's the whole yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. And but even the, like, I mean, the, the scarecrow and I mean, the, uh, the tin man, they all represent, you know, different things, you know. Yeah. Um, but in, in the case of the like the uh, this Trinity debate, it's not actually about the Trinity. It's actually yeah. a debate about gender and how do you uh, differentiate and uh, gender and have male authority within marriage. Now, there, there can be some other arguments to um, to discuss, to, to, to dis discuss that or establish that. But the Trinity is definitely not the place you want to get that. And the temptation is many people, you know, whether you're um, uh, whether you're a Catholic social theologian or whether you're um, a complementarian Baptist or you know or a liberal Anglican, everyone wants to get their little social project about marriage, community, society. They all want to treat my ideal society, my ideal relationship, as the imago trinitatis, as the image of yeah. the Trinity. And what they end up doing is projecting their ideal society, their ideal church government, their ideal marriage into the Trinity. That's right. So you, you've got to remember that's what's going on. And, and which, by the way, I think you, you document very, very well um, in yeah. this book where yeah. you locate um, the uh, the eternal functional subordination, the EFS crowd, as a type of um, variation of this social Trinitarianism where the, the Trinity is reflected yeah, in our own kind of social and relational projects, so people can say that the Trinity is our social project. Yeah. Um, to yeah. answer to, to the Trinity, the Trinity is our God who calls us to participate in the Missio Day in the world. That's what we should be saying, not trying to project our own ideas of the, of the ideal community back into the Trinity. Yeah, yeah, uh, that says it so well, and that's that's uh, that's how I start off. Really, is saying. Mm -hmm. It, it was a bit eye-opening for me as I started to read, you know, you mentioned 19th century. Uh, I started to just read 19th century and 20th century and just thought, wait a minute, uh, we're calling this a Trinitarian Renaissance, but what kind of Trinity is it? Uh, it was very much a, a social Trinity with that became the everybody's social program. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're here talking about, you know, one, one thing, uh, you know, gender discussions, but that was just a one uh, among many. Uh, I mean, politics, goodness, politics became um, an agenda for the Trinity and then uh, so, so much more. So, yeah. yeah, it's the story of the 20th century is just that it is. Uh, redefining the Trinity in, in societal terms, uh, which is very easy then, right, for us to project, project our experience with each other uh, and just assume that's the case of the triune God. 
And then to come right back and say, oh, well, how fitting. This trinity then is the paradigm. This is the prototype for my particular view of this aspect of society. I think it's important for, you know, uh, people to see the two of us talking about this, right? Because yeah, yeah. I'm guessing that, uh, you know, you and I will, will probably land on different different places in terms of, you know, gender discussions, but but we both would agree, hey, let's, let's not use the Trinity, uh, let's not redefine the Trinity in this social way to then use it for either, either position. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, the Trinity is not where you get your view of economics, marriage, or, you know, social ethics validated. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the Trinity yeah. is, is, is what, at one sense, an ineffable mystery yeah. to a degree uh, of which we have, we have um, insights and genuine revelation through, through scripture, which we understand, particularly in light of the tradition who have wrestled with scripture ahead of us. Yeah. Uh, it's not the place that we get our little, you know, our little niche projects sponsored. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's, but that's the danger in every age to do that with some aspect or something or, or with theology and, and church life. But I, I was going to say, in, in your experience, in your experience, man, I've got, I've got to ask, um, you know, the, the people who have this, let's call them the EFS, the EFSs, that's the, that's the term you use in your book. Uh, they're very good at wrestling with scripture. They have a high view of scripture. They believe scripture is norm, normative, not negotiable. But w given their high view of scripture, where do you think they go wrong then? W yeah. Where does the problem come in? If they've got this, how can some people who are, who are very devout, we don't, we don't question the, the authenticity or the seriousness or the vitality of their faith, we commend it. But if they've got such a high view of scripture, where and why do they go wrong? Yeah. Well, I think there's a couple things to say. Um, one is this. Uh, the constant mantra that, well, we've got scripture on our side, or we believe in scripture, is a bit, uh, well, it's a bit frustrating to everybody else, <laughs> because uh, most evangelicals out there today uh, that are thinking theologically, uh, and even biblically, are going to say, well, yes, I too believe in the authority of scripture. Uh, but what makes it all the more a bit nagging is that in light of what we just said, on the one hand, I think that EFSers in the past have said, well, I'm, I just believe the Bible. I'm just claiming to, to, to just repeat what the Bible says. But as we just talked about, the very language they're using, the, the way they move from um, God and himself to uh, society, uh, actually, a hard look at that is it's very, very conspicuous. This is just 20th century hermeneutics. Uh, this is also 20th century theology that turns the Trinity into our social program. So, a, so I, I guess I say that is, is the first thing because there's a bit of irony there uh, yeah. in saying, oh, we're just, believe, we're just believing the Bible, but in yeah. fact... Uh, and that is so important because people think they're just reading the Bible but they are completely unaware of how much freight they are carrying, yes. how much of their own, and how much of their own context and environment is affecting them. And, and that, that, is, that is why you need to talk to people from a wider background. You yes. know, like maybe talk to someone who's a liberal, a liberationist, maybe, you know, maybe evangelical, but slightly different. Talk from someone from church history. And when they can point out, you're the only guy saying that. Yeah. And sometimes, and then if they point out, sometimes the road less traveled is less traveled for a good reason. Right. Um, right. So I, I think, I think that's, I think that's, yeah. I mean, and I would say that of a, a lot of us, we need to be more self critical yeah. in how we read scripture. Yeah. And you need friends who can help you be self critical. And, yeah. that, that, and that stops you going, as I like to tell my students, totes cray cray, yeah. and ending up with your own <laughs> TV show on yeah. TVN at about five in the morning. <laughs> Which the first the first lesson the the first you know red flag should be five in the morning that should tell you something something's wrong, <laughs> but exactly. but to your to to your point right I I hope people uh, hear this from us we're not we're not voicing this criticism because we're we're saying oh no 
you know, out of almost pride, like uh, mm -hmm. we're the ones that, no, we're, we're saying this out of really a, a consensus to say, let's actually read the Bible with humility, which means let's consider whether we're being influenced in a certain way. In this case, I think by 20th century social Trinitarianism and ask, well, is it, is it actually affecting us in ways we don't, we don't want to admit? And yeah. have we maybe borrowed a vocabulary that we just assumed and now it's, it's actually showing itself. I mean, you mentioned earlier, um, just to give an example of this, you know, you mentioned earlier uh, how you were a bit shocked when, you know, you kind of looked at EFS and then also went back in history and, and noticed that, oh, actually there's these uh, homoions uh, who are, yeah, EFS may end up with a different conclusion in the end, but they're reading the Bible with the same type of hermeneutic. Exactly. Uh, I mean, when we come to um, the Gospels or Paul's epistles, for example, um, you know, you asked me, you know, what's, what's, they're believing in biblical authority. Um, they're taking the Bible seriously. I would say yes and amen to that. But mm -hmm. when they're coming to the actual text, they're not necessarily paying attention to really crucial and sometimes just basic rules of hermeneutics. So maybe we could just bat a couple around for a yeah. second here. Um, you know, I, I can't help but think of Augustine. You know, Augustine, uh, he has these, you know, you mentioned Rahner's rule. Uh, Augustine, I like Augustine's rules because um, he... he you know, we call them Augustine's rules, but but really they're they're just kind of natural ways that we read scripture without realizing it. Um, he'll talk about when we come to the, the gospels in particular, and we see texts that speak of the son and the father. He says, well, uh, at times a text may be referring to the son in the form of God. Yeah. At other times, this is a second rule, he'll say it may be referring to the son and the form of a servant. And uh, Augustine makes a, uh, puts a lot of emphasis there because he says, well, in light of what the Bible is, showing us how God saves in redemptive history, those, there's a lot of those, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's, that's actually one of the prime uh, emphases across the whole narrative. And then he'll say, uh, then there's this third one, right? Which I forget what he calls it. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure there's a clever name for it, I'm just going to call it sent, sent text in which um, there's the author, the biblical author will refer to the fact that the father sends the son. And he says, you know, with those that the point is not, you know, greater or lesser or anything like that. It's, it's showing the origin. Um, Augustine gets super frustrated though, because uh, along come, you know, Arians or semi-Arians in his day. And, they just open the scriptures and uh, say, well, we're just reading the scriptures. We're just looking at this verse. And what Augustine says is, no, 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 no. You, you're, you're not paying any attention to these basic rules. You're starting to confuse the rules. Hmm. You start mixing them up or you, you, you start to mesh them together. And uh, Augustine, Augustine is looking at texts like uh, Philippians 2, for example, and he's saying, listen, this is, ma Paul's making a very clear distinction here about, yes, this is the eternal son uh, who shares the same glory as the father. He's actually one with the father. Yeah. And yet he humbles himself. Uh, something that's just like mind blowing, shocking, which should say something right about he is equal. <laughs> mm. So there's this huge contrast that he would become a servant for our sake. Um, what is Augustine doing? I, I think what he's doing there, and, and hopefully if we're, you know, when we read the Bible today, we do this maybe without realizing it, I hope, yeah. but he is simply understanding exactly what you said at the beginning, right? He's understanding I'm opening the Bible because this is a revelation of the eternal, infinite triune God. And so I, I had better distinguish between who God is in and of himself and uh, 
how he then reveals himself in the economy, which in light of the incarnation, of course, when it comes to incarnation, he's going to speak then in terms of servanthood and humbling. I mean, Hebrews will even be so bold to say he learned obedience, you know, Hebrews 5a. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, when you when you teach, uh, and, and, you know, the maybe there's an EFSer and they, they raise, you know, the objection of, well, look at when I look at a gospel or I look at, you know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, it's, it, it's, you know, 1 Corinthians 15 says, you know, Jesus, Jesus is subjected to the Father. Well, that just must mean that in the imminent life of God, uh, subordination or submission just defines the Son in and of, you know, apart from the world. I mean, yeah. what, when you come to a text like 1 Corinthians 15, why don't you come to that conclusion? Oh, yeah, because you, you've got to look at the wider, I think, sense of Scripture, as I think you've pointed to. You know, you do have these uh, subordination texts, which people point to, like, you know, Philippians 2, where the son was, you know, obedient unto death, you know, obedient to the father. And then 1 Corinthians 15, where, you know, um, you know, finally he, uh, he hands the kingdom over to the father and, and, and the father, but that's talking about his messianic office, his mm -hmm. human role. That's how we understand that because these same texts can point out things that Jesus has equality with God. He's in the very form of God shares in God's uh, being. And it's not the case of that son is just some kind of divine subcontractor um, who's, yeah. who's being called to do these particular tasks and the other thing you also have to point out, and this is, I think, dovetails with a bit with Augustine, is you have something called inseparable, inseparable operations, ah. that it, the members of the Trinity are involved in each other's work. So, you know, the, the, the Father, we, we attribute the role of creation to the Father, but the Father creates through Son and the Spirit. Yeah. And, you know, the Son is Redeemer, but he's Redeemer on behalf of the Father, and he does it you know, in tandem with the Spirit. It's the Spirit who is sent by the Father, <laughs> maybe through the Son, um, um, who then applies the work of redemption and that's why it's the spirit of Christ. So it, 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 given these inseparable operations, as you know, Augustine would call them, it makes a much, much more sense that there is a unity between them in their being, their purpose and the salvation that they're achieving rather than there's three discrete roles which have three discrete levels of authority. Yeah, yeah. You know, when, when you, you think of a text like, First Corinthians 15, um, and you, I like the way you just put it there, right? You meant, yeah, I think you used the word Messiah, is yes. Messianic. Um, that's so key, isn't it? Because mm. sure, if you, if, you just, if you just look at one verse, uh, you could see how you would just extrapolate from that and start projecting that back onto the imminent life of God and say, oh, there must be hierarchy, Hmm. Even if it's a functional hierarchy, there must be some type of hierarchy that's person defining for the sun. Um, but what I like to remind uh, people of is, well, hold on. I mean, we we wouldn't approach any chapter of the Bible that way. Yeah. Let's look at the context. In the context, why does Paul have so much to say about the suffering of Christ and the resurrection? And why does he keep referring to uh, Christ in these Adamic, like echoes of Adamic concept. Yeah. Like a uh, new Adam, could, yeah. Could it be, could it be, right, that remember in the Old Testament, uh, Adam, he was called a son, he failed, <laughs> right? Israel, what's Israel called in the Pentateuch? God's firstborn son, the prophets pick up this language, right? Yeah. Uh, could it be that while those sons failed to obey the covenant now comes a son who does something that is so humbling that he doesn't do you know in in the imminent life of god but he does it for the sake of the mission of salvation he humbles himself to the point where he fulfills the covenant he 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 obeys it perfectly he does what adam failed Adam and Israel failed to do. I don't think it's accidental that Paul becomes known, whether it's biblical scholarship or even systematic scholarship, he starts to become known for this type of, of uh, Adamic covenantal theme because Christ, he, he's 
practically jumping for joy, right? By the time he gets mm -hmm. done with the chapter, Christ is the one who actually re recapitulates that whole uh, experience of Israel, uh, but this time he does so as the uh, the one who actually is faithful to the covenant. All that yep. to say, when we then come to the end of 1 Corinthians 15 and we start inserting this idea of you know an eternal subordination, we miss the whole point of, of salvation and it kind of puts a damper on, dare I say, it actually like undermines the complete finished work of Christ, which is Paul's whole point. I guess I guess what I'm trying to say over and over again is um, Paul is just obsessed at this point, not with the imminent life of God, but with the economy of salvation and what Christ has done to bring the kingdom back to the Father and say, I did it. I, I, yeah. I was faithful while Israel failed. That, that, that's exactly right. And to give another example where I think the EFS breaks down is in the relationship between Christ and the spirit, because the, uh -huh. the authority there really changed. And I, and I owe this insight to my colleague, Scott Harrow, who did his PhD thesis on this very topic. He says like during Jesus's ministry, the spirit seems to be the dominant partner. So it's the spirit that drives Jesus in the wilderness. You know, Jesus can do no uh, mighty works, no miracles, no amazing deeds, you know, without the spirit's empowerment. So you get the feeling that the spirit is something of the dominant partner in that relationship. And it's the spirit that it's the spirit that the father uses to raise Christ from the dead. And yet when Jesus is exalted to the father's right hand, it is Christ who is then the giver of the spirit. Uh, and the Holy spirit yeah. is even then called the spirit of Christ. Spirit and it's Christ. the spirit who's then applying the work of salvation and the spirit we're told doesn't seek glory for himself, but seeks the glory of, of the father. So you could say that you actually get an inversion of yeah. authority in the Christ spirit relationship, certainly as it plays out across Luke Acts. Now, how do you project that into the imminent life of the Trinity? How, how do you get this um, sort of, you know, um, change of roles and authority if, that's, that, that, if, that's, if that is somehow imminent to God's being? Yeah. And I think, I think my colleague, Scott, is very good at saying that's one point where uh, Rana's rule that the economic and the imminent Trinity are together needs a lot more nuance and a lot more footnotes yeah. Um, in order, and you can have soft or hard ways of, of reading Rana's right. rule. So I, I think that's that, that, that I think the Christ spirit relationship is even a better example of why that kind of projection into the imminent Trinity um, kind of does kind of break down yeah. in a sense. Yeah, it is. It really is a type of projection. I mean, they, they will deny that, of course. Um, but I think there's a lot of truth to it. Maybe, maybe they don't realize they're doing it, but there is a projection. It's fascinating you mentioned the Holy Spirit, right? Mm. You know, when we talk about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, EFSers like to say, well, uh, this type of functional hierarchy, take the, you know, the Father and the Son, for example, this is, um, this is person defining. Um, mm. And so while they want to say, well, the Son is still equal in essence, uh, nonetheless, he's he's functionally submiss submissive or subordinate. Nonetheless, it's it's still uh, what part of what defines the son as son. And here they they play on the names themselves. Well, it's a bit it's a bit uh, ironic, right? Because what do you do when you come to the spirit? The sp yeah. the spirit doesn't have a name that you could somehow read that into that type of hierarchy into. Yet they will say, oh, the spirit is actually you know use the the term glory. Uh, earlier, the spirit is actually even further uh, in, in terms of the, the functional hierarchy scale, e e furthest down. But the the very name spirit doesn't doesn't convey that. Um, it, it's a bit of a it's an awkward moment in which you have to wonder. Well, hold on, this breaks down then because it doesn't work for all all, all three persons. Uh, yeah, I, it, it makes me wonder. You know if we go back to the the incarnation for example and and just the whole economy of salvation um and maybe i i could ask you this question too um if we say let, let's just like go, go along with it for a second right and let's just say okay there's this um eternal functional subordination um when you get to a a, a philippians 2 or hebrews 5 8 um what at that point, 
um, do, have, we, have we undermined the whole scandal of the cross? I mean, it, is, is this just a type, because you start to wonder, well, is this something the son has always done anyways? And if that's the case, is, is this grace that Paul, for example, or Hebrews, for example, talks about, is it as uh, outrageous in its gratitude as we think? Yeah. I mean, what, are you, what, what are your thoughts on all this? Yeah, I mean, because the, the Father, Son, and the Spirit are all equal with a, with a shared being, uh, it is more amazing that one of the persons takes on a human life and becomes yeah. obedient to the point of death and then returns to the Father and, and sends the Spirit. Um, if there was a, a, rather than a trinity, a triunity, if there was a hierarchy, then you could say the Son is just doing his job. You could say it's, right. it's nothing more than that. He just, he just, he's just doing his job. What he, it's what a he continuation. Yeah. Now, what, what I, I do think you have to ask the question, what is it about the Son that makes the Son particularly fit for incarnation as yeah. opposed to the father or as opposed to, to the spirit. And, and then you can talk about something specific to a father, son and, and spirit relationship. But even that is based on um, what we would call the eternal relations of origin, yes. not on authority of roles and submission. So what makes it fitting for the son to be incarnate is the fact that he's eternally begotten of the father, not that he's kind of a second tier. He's kind of like the, um, God the Father's adjutant in some right. sort of you know he heavenly military council or something like that. Yeah. You know that that that's what that's that that's how we've got to distinguish those things. So yeah, I, I think you, you have a more amazing grace in a Trinity that's characterized by one by uh, you know one God in three persons in one power, unity, and eternity. You know that that point you just made about the fittingness, right? That language that we see throughout the fathers as they are uh, approaching the scriptures um, is so key, right? Because wh why is it that the son is sent? Um, well, he's sent by the father. That's fitting, be not because there's some intrinsic uh, subordination within the imminent life of God, even if you call it functional. No, uh, it's fitting because, well, he's the one who is from the father. Uh, from all eternity. He's begotten. Here we can use the language of eternal generation, right? He's begotten from the Father's essence um, from all eternity. And, and likewise, when we talk about the Spirit, as we were doing a minute ago, we can say, why is it so fitting uh, for the Spirit to be sent? Pentecost, for example, you know, sent from the Father and Son. Well, this is the same Spirit who uh, is proceeds or is spirated mm -hmm. from the Father and Son from all eternity. Uh, you don't have to somehow try to insert into that, that fittingness. You don't have to try to insert some type of hierarchy. You don't, you don't need to go there. No, the, that, that correspondence is already a natural fit uh, in so many ways. This is, mm -hmm. this is one of the reasons why, you know, I think it's, you know, with EFS, um, they will say things like, well, uh, as long as, as there's something in the text that we think uh, there's some type of submission that transcends the incarnation, well, then that proves our case. To which I, I, I would love to hear what you think about this, but I, like to, I would like to respond to that and just say, well, why are we playing by those rules? Like, isn't that, isn't that the wrong type of eternity? I mean, aren't we conflating here the imminent life of God with the economy of salvation? I mean, shouldn't we instead uh, be distinguishing to say, well, the economy of salvation is a, is a wide, has a wide scope from election all the way to glorification and new heavens and new earth. But that's a, that's a different discussion than when we are talking about God apart from creation, God apart from salvation, in and of himself as the one simple, undivided, indivisible Father, Son, and Spirit. Yeah, I think you've put it very well. I don't really have much to, to add to that. 
Um, and I, I do think the debate is coming down to what is the relationship between the economic trinity, God as we see him in creation, yeah. Yeah. Um, redemption and consummation, and how do, does that relate to God in himself? If you completely conflate the two, um, it can be problematic. Uh, or, yeah. or people tend to selectively conflate the two. They'll take yes. one aspect of God, of the economy and reject that. Like I said, you know, they're happy to reject to put to reject the incarnation back into the Trinity, but they're not going to do that with Christ and the Spirit. So people want to selectively read the economy back into the imminent Trinity. But the but the other hand, if you separate the imminent Trinity from the economy, then you've got the danger that we don't really know what God is like. Because if the economy does not reflect something of his God, what God is, then then you then you then you, you, you can't, well, has there really been a revelation of God? If God in his operations and economy is different from God in his being, then you've got the, the fact that we don't really have a revelation of God and we still have an, an, an element of, of mystery there yeah. that, has, that has not been disclosed to us. So mm. th 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 there is a danger, like I said, there's a danger of both ways of conflating the, the economic and the Trinity right. and doing it so selectively, yeah. but you don't want to fully separate the two either. Uh, yeah. and, and that's and that's 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 what I think Bart Rana and even Thomas Torrance were concerned about because they spoke a lot about the eminent and economic, but they wanted to say no. We really know what God is like because He's shown us in what He's done. But that's developed its own. Uh, that's it, developed further, been taken in different directions for right. different ends, different agendas, and uh, that that's kind of where it goes. I mean, uh, people like Fred Sanders, I think, have written you know quite a lot on that on the, on that relationship between the two, mm. and which, which is I think would probably be the the place I'd want to start a conversation yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah. Fred's done some excellent excellent work on how Revelation then speaks to that very issue. Mm. One one of the things uh, when I'm asked this question, one of the things I I often will say uh, to people is. Uh, yes, absolutely. The, um, the economic does reveal something about uh, the imminent, but maybe we could put it a little bit differently, right? To say, it's not just kind of willy nilly, you, you subjectively decide what it is. <laughs> uh, in the 20th century, right? Moltmann does this and he wants to take mm. suffering and just read it right back into the Godhead. Ah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a bit ironic that we're having these discussions about EFS, similar, similar type of move, but now with subordination or submission. Well, all that to say, maybe we could be more specific then when we're talking about imminent economic. Um, I, I like, for example, how some of the older biblical interpreters and theologians would say missions reveals processions because now he's like oh okay it's it's actually something very specific that's mm -hmm. being revealed to us it's not exhausting the mystery of god the missions are meant to then reveal to us this specific thing oh the the unity of god but but then also the processions themselves the father unbegotten the son begotten the spirit spirated well that is a very uh specific careful move back and forth right uh than just saying oh well here's the economy uh it's fair game <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> what you want to read exactly. back in uh, yeah exactly that exactly. could be quite dangerous um yeah now maybe we could we maybe we should uh uh you know tie up our our discussion here with a bow i mean we started this right with um yeah you know, talking about hermeneutics. Um, in, in, at the end, in my book, I, I, I basically say, uh, let's, let's be super careful uh, when we're approaching the economy. And, and uh, I talk about how uh, we, we need to uh, make sure that we're not just adopting that uh, kind of fast and loose bib biblicism type hermeneutic. Yep. You, you, you have used the example of, uh, you know, the, the Sausage Maker 3000. Um, yep. We're making kind of the same point different ways. Um, now you've got a, a new uh, a second edition, I, I think I'm right in saying a second edition yes. of your systematic that just came out. How yep. maybe, you, you know, you, you're over there, I'm over here, we're on different sides of the ocean, but um, I, I don't think I'm wrong in saying that we, we both have experience just a, a strong uh, narrow biblicism that 
can even be skeptical towards theology or let alone systematics. Sometimes yeah. it ends up with e this EFS hermeneutic. So come in, let's come full circle. I mean, how, with your 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 second edition, how do you uh, try to encourage <laughs> your your readers and your students and churchgoers uh, how to read the Bible in a way that that doesn't you know put the meat through the, the sausage grinder? Yeah, and and what what I tell people, um, you know. You, you can't just you, you can't just say it's just me and the Bible. And, and I tell a story like this. I, I knew a, a young Presbyterian girl who, who attended, uh, was visiting a church for once, and the preacher got up and he said, you know, when I prepared the sermon, I didn't consult any commentary. I didn't read any book by man. I, I, I just prayed and I was led by the Holy Spirit to, to bring the sermon to you today. And then at the end of the service where the, 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 the minister was greeting people um, at the door, um, and he noticed that the young, young Presbyterian lassie was, was, was visiting. And he said, well, what, what did you think of the sermon? And she said, well, to be perfectly honest, I, I wasn't really listening. <laughs> and she, he said, well, why weren't you listening? And she said, well, why should I listen to you? You don't listen to anybody else. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think that's, that's what it is. And yeah. what I would say, it, it's... It's not kind of um, the, the the Bible is, is not something that is going to uh, leap out and mystically implant to you all the information. You know, learning, studying, the rewarding work of being edified. Um, it, it's 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 not a, an individual act. It is a community act. And in in other words, I, I like to tell people we all need a Philip to run beside our chariot. Yeah. And to help us understand what we're doing, even if only to prevent us from grave errors and ending up with our own cult and a TV show on TVN. You know, we, <laughs> even, <laughs> even if someone says, mm, yeah, Mike, I'm not too sure you should talk about yourself as a reincarnation of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I don't think that's going to work. Uh, and that that Philip who runs beside our chariot can be, you know, um, your, your, your Bible study group. It can be uh, a really good trusted teacher who's whose videos you watch and, and books you read. And it is also the wider wisdom of the Christian church globally in a horizontal way, yeah. and then more vertically in church history. Okay. And if you think you've got nothing to learn from an Augustine or a Tertullian or anything like that, quite frankly, you should give up biblical studies and consider a career in marketing or something <laughs> like that. Okay, yeah. where you can just be creative and innovative and not care what anyone else thinks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and that that is what that 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 is the number one thing I think we need. You need some epistemic humility, and it's not just me and my ESV. Okay. You need the wider suite of a, of a community within the context of reading scripture and we're looking at doctrine, a doctrine is formulated. Mm. And if you're going to come across some doctrine, uh, particularly a key doctrine, and say, well, that doesn't sound right. Um, You've got to have jolly good reasons for thinking so. And, and odds are someone else has come up with that same question, the same issue before, and you're right. And what you should go back is, well, if this if this is question has been raised and rejected in the past, why was that? Exactly, and, yeah. and, that and that's where you find out, as I tell students, sometimes the road less traveled is less traveled for a good reason. That's right. <laughs> And when Nana says, don't eat the mushrooms, you don't, don't say, mushroom. okay, boomer. Yeah. Right. Well, pleasure talking to you, Matt. Yes, absolutely. It's, it, it's always fun. And uh, we'll have to do it again sometime. Uh, thanks for all your writings, Mike, and uh, all, all the good that you're doing out there. Excellent. Thank you very much, Matt.